Melvin Queenie was in his 40s and on trial for indecency with a child in 1991. His son John taking the stand to talk about the abuse he endured and accusing his dad of being in a satanic cult. More than 30 years later, the two were back in a courtroom, this time to tell the truth. Did you testify truthfully and accurately in that proceeding? Um, no. Has your father ever sexually abused? No, he hasn't. This is South Texas Crime Stories, Satanic Panic, Part 2. Last week, we took a closer look at what Satanic Panic was and how it affected thousands across the country, including the case of a San Antonio man, Melvin Queenie, who was accused of being in a Satanic cult and sexually assaulting two of his children. Queenie's oldest son, John, was urged to testify. He did, and that testimony ultimately was the factor in Melvin being found guilty and sentenced to 20 years in prison. We jump ahead to 31 years later, and in June 2022, both Melvin and John were back in court, this time to set the record straight. Melvin was seeking exoneration for his past conviction, and John, after years of being brainwashed and then later discovering the truth, was ready to talk about what actually happened and to tell the court he had lied. I guess you would have been uh, 10 years old in July of 1991 when you came to court and testified in this case? Yes. And have you had a chance to review your, the transcript of your testimony? Yes, I have. And uh, is, uh, is that, did you testify truthfully and accurately in that proceeding? Um, no, I, not, at the time, I thought I was testifying more truthfully, but I know now that was not the case. We'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, are you retracting that testimony, at least the part where you uh, accused your father of sexually abusing you? Yes, yes I am. Has your father ever sexually abused? No, he hasn't. After the accusations came out, Melvin's wife immediately moved out with the kids. John and sister were put into therapy and even put into foster care for a while. John spoke about how when he talked about memories with his father, he was told those memories weren't what they actually were. Here's how John explained it. One thing that I know happened right away is they were very quickly able to convince me that if I had a good memory of something, that those memories were put there to cover up something traumatic. If I, if I told them I enjoyed watching scary movies, I would be told that my dad was forcing me to watch scary movies to get me accustomed to evil stuff. John's therapist would also later put him on several medications and eventually convince him that he had been sexually abused. Because I do know that for at least a while I remember saying nothing happened, nothing happened. And and that, that wasn't a good enough answer for them. And then at some point, I don't know when it was, like I just started buying into it. John was even made to believe there were other kids that had been hurt by his father and would be testifying with him. But when it came time to go to trial, John was the only child to take the stand. During his exoneration trial, John also spoke about how life was never the same for him after the trial and how his mother always kept them moving around and would tell them Satanists were after them. We moved to different cities based solely on the fact that we're helping fight this big government devil cult. You know, we started going to uh, more charismatic Pentecostal type churches where, um, you know, spiritual warfare is what the term they use, is a really important aspect of it. So, you know, things like the idea of me or my brother or my sister having a fit or having a, an anger issue De were possibly demon possessed so we'd have people from the church come over and pray for us and cast out demons and um 
Because like I said, there was nothing we, nothing we did was normal. Eventually, Melvin, who was sentenced to 20 years, was let out after serving eight years because of good behavior. At the time, Melvin had no idea where his kids were and hadn't spoken or seen them since the day they moved out. And then one day, he got a message on Facebook and everything would change for him and his kids. Hello, KSAT viewers. I'm Stefania Jimenez, anchor and reporter at KSAT 12 in San Antonio. On weeknights, you'll catch me on the Night Beat. Many of you want the news before 10 p.m., and this is for you. It's called The Nine at Night, a live nine-minute digital newscast airing at, you guessed it, 9 p.m. Call it a bite-sized show that's tailor-made for you. You'll get the day's top stories, weather, upcoming community events, and feel-good stories. Find us on YouTube, KSAT.com, and KSAT Plus, available on Amazon Fire Stick, Apple TV, Roku, or any way you stream. And, of course, via podcast. So like or subscribe wherever you get your audio. That way you'll get the alert when each episode drops. That starts later this month. Until then, head on over to KSAT.com and sign up to be a KSAT Insider. That's where you'll get the inside scoops on all of our new and exciting projects. So after hearing all of that testimony, Lee, what were your first thoughts when hearing John and kind of what he went through? I think it's just, I mean, if anyone abused those kids, it was the people who essentially brainwashed them into turning against his own father. That's who truly abused the children. It's not It's not Melvin. It's the ever, everyone else. Yeah, and he went on to talk about how it was a specialized group of therapy group who I think was called Minerva Maya and their specialty was satanic abuse and speaking to children about the quote-unquote abuse they endured but just how they went about doing it like when he talked about I you know talked about a memory with my father like no that was that was him you know telling you scary movies are you know for for evil people Who does it to a 10-year-old? Exactly. At at such a young age to be just told, no, 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 what you thought that was wasn't what it was. And you're trying, you're told, okay, these are adults you can trust. As a kid, you don't normally question the authority of adults. If you have all of these other adults seeing your dad's a bad guy and your dad did some really bad stuff to you and your sister, you're going to be like, after a while, I, I guess that did happen. It was to the point where he also even made up a story about his father and his father's friend who was also in the satanic cult had killed two women and his mother even like verified possibly seeing this fbi got involved and there was a weeks long search for these random women of course no bodies were never found melvin was never charged with a murder but he was like everything i was made to believe was almost like reversed. It was like a reverse psychology that they were kind of using on him. And it's almost sad because he later said in when he was on the stand that all his good memories were kind of erased because they were made to be bad memories and he just didn't have any more fond memories with his father. I mean, that's just so awful. And that had to have been so heartbreaking for Melvin too to see the kids he obviously loves. They're his flesh and blood to say these things about him that he knows very well aren't true. That just had to be such a traumatizing experience for Melvin, for John, for John's sister, everyone involved in this. They have some serious trauma after something like this. Yeah, it was really hard for this family, even after the trial, just everything that they continued to endure. And it wasn't until John sat around when he was 17 years old, when his mother got sick and he started realizing Maybe my father wasn't as bad as people said he was. Maybe he didn't do these things. Here's what John said he kind of realized about that moment. I I feel like 
when I first started really having any real doubts about it, um, my mom had had a stroke. I had had a lot of time to just sit around with my mom to spend time. I wasn't working. Um, she was paralyzed on her left side, so we weren't leaving the house much. We would just kind of sit around and watch TV and talk. And and before, when we there were conversations come up about the past, uh, especially with my dad. Um, you know, they weren't they weren't fun, pleasant conversations. Uh, when stuff started coming up at this time, and now one thing to keep in mind is my, at this point, all of our focus was on my mom's physical health. She hadn't been to the therapist um, regularly for a year and a half, a couple of years. Her medications that she was on were all geared to keeping her alive. So just kind of off my, based off what it was like for me to get out of the therapy and, and clear my mind from the medications, I, I really do believe at that point her her mind was clearing up a little bit because when we would, we would have conversations about my dad, we were able to have good conversations and good memories and and the memories that I would bring up weren't being challenged by her or anybody else. It's definitely the most time I ever had just to really get to know my mom and and uh, like I, maybe the first time she ever felt comfortable telling me that she had a drug problem. As, as he got older and as his mom was approaching her final moments, that's when the truth finally came out. That's when he started realizing maybe not everything was accurate, but it still didn't push him to go and completely believe his father. And that kind of led to a reunion between Melvin and his kids. Melvin's youngest son at the time this happened in 1991 was an infant. He was merely weeks old, so he really never knew who his father was, finds him on Facebook and sends him a message like, hey, I'm your youngest son. I don't know exactly what all happened, but I, you know, maybe we could talk. Melvin replies, and then the brother stops from replying back, almost like he was, maybe I shouldn't do this, you know. John's going to get mad at me for reaching out. Maybe I shouldn't do this. So he stopped. But then Melvin sent another message and be like, look, here's what happened. Here's what I have to say. And he showed that message to John. And that's when John realized, okay, maybe I should go meet my father again. And here's what he had to say about that realization and reading that letter, that Facebook post from his father. I remember I got that and I decided I was going to go read it. And it took, it took maybe two hours, three hours for me to get through it. I had to stop in the middle and um, kind of collect myself. He mentioned how, like, you know, he mentioned the good things we did, you know, and those, the, 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 the real, me the memories I already remembered, like stuff that I already remembered and I knew to be true. Now here, here's somebody saying, you know, like validating what I, what I knew. And then when he, the more I read it, like, like I said, it, it just, I, I knew, I knew by the time I got done that I had, I made a, a mistake. Like I, I, I messed up. Was there any anger or blame in his letters? No, there was no, no anger geared at, you talking about at us or at, okay. no, not at all. Um, just love? Yeah. So afterwards. The siblings get in a car, they're living in the Dallas area, and they drive to San Antonio, and they meet their father. And he's like, when we drove up, it was nothing what I expected. He never held any ill will toward him. He never expected anything of him, only that he just wanted to be a part of their lives again. I mean, I just think that it just shows what love he actually had for his kids. And I mean eight years behind bars for something you didn't do, that had to be just excruciating, knowing that you love your kids and knowing you wanted to be their father all those years and having that time ripped away. It had to be excruciating. Yeah, and, and it was also interesting to hear them, to hear John talk about how their relationship now formed and them realizing that he had it wrong all, all along and wanting to make it right. So that was why they sought out help. They wanted their father to be exonerated. While he had already served his time, while he already done his parole, 
he still was kind of looked at as a sex offender and they wanted to make sure his name was cleared. And so the Texas Innocent Project ends up taking their case. And that's why we were in court this past summer. It was an exoneration case. So that's what why we all were in that courtroom. That's why this was all brought up again, because Melvin is seeking an exoneration for something that was obviously not accurate. So where does everything then stand at this point? So that trial judge um, recently released his ruling, and his ruling was like, yes, this man needs to be exonerated, but now it has to go to the Court of Appeals to agree on that ruling. If the Court of Appeals does agree, it goes back to that judge, and there's an official date to set that exoneration. Now, if you think about it, here in Texas, if you're wrongfully accused and you've spent time, you get paid for that time that you spent in jail. And I don't know if that's, I don't think that's their obvious goal is to get money in this case, only to have their father's names cleared by the court system. But it's just something to think about when this does go back, if it does go back to the trial court and he actually gets exonerated in this case. So do you have like an estimate on how long that could possibly take? Like you said, his trial judge said, yeah, I think he should be exonerated. Then it has these other processes it has to go through. How long does that take? It usually depends on the case. So we heard this in June. He released his report in September. That was a few months there. The appeals court can take anywhere from three months to a year. So it's going to happen. It just might take, they have other cases. It's not, you know, just something they could just say, oh, yep. Yeah. You know, they, they look it over, like all over all the evidence in this case. And I'm, I'm sure they take that judge's opinion into consideration. Um, so I would be almost shocked if the appeals court doesn't exonerate him. There was just too much obvious evidence to show this was a wrongful conviction. Absolutely. I mean, like nothing can give him those eight years back and that that time away from his kids after he was out of jail. Nothing's going to give him that time back. But at least having the status of a free man, a free man who was wrongfully convicted. I mean, I think that would still go a long way. And he has his children back. I think that's the best part of the story. Despite the damage it caused to this family, there is some kind of relief for them. And I think Despite what satanic panic may have caused this family years ago, and you know, there's not something they're always going to get over, but at least they have each other now and they could see each other and there's nothing between them that shows this ever happened in the first place. Well, this isn't the only satanic panic case to have affected lives in San Antonio. Next week on part three, we speak with Anna Vasquez, who was one of the four women known as the San Antonio Four. She talks about being wrongfully convicted and accused of being part of satanic related acts on a child. That interview and story next week on South Texas Crime Stories. 